moment the shadow starts his first adventure of the season. But first, a word about this master of men's minds. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the shadow, he is the sworn enemy of criminals, lawbreakers, and shortsters. An invaluable help to the shadow is his hypnotic ability to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. This he accomplishes by means of mystic occult powers acquired during the years he spent in the Orient. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the shadow belongs. Today's story, Death in a Minor Key. (laughs) Thank God you know that's funny. Death in a Minor Key. You know, to me, that expression brings back the memory of a series of weird, eerie musical notes in a minor key that, uh, well, it had a tragic bearing on my life. You know, it's funny, isn't it, how all of us recall a certain sound that we associate in our minds with a strange, indeterminate feeling of uneasiness or or fear. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, like the cry of a coyote as it's silhouetted against the night sky. Or the wild shriek of a siren as an ambulance catapults through the city's darkened streets. And then then there's even the sound of a distant train whistle, punctuating the evening stillness, bringing with it that that lost, empty sensation of of being all alone in a strange, lonesome world around (laughs) you. You know, that's odd. I I just happen to think that all those sounds that I described to you are night sounds. Yeah, I guess that does have significance, too. Because the night is... Well, night is a time for fear. And it was at night, too, that those notes in a minor key were heard. Faintly at first. Ever so faintly. Played on a strange instrument. Then as they came closer, you heard uneven heavy-footed steps. The sounds are louder now. Footsteps. Nearer. 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 (laughs) Ah, I seem to be getting ahead of my story. It's one that I think will interest you, so if you'd like me to pass it on, suppose I start at the beginning. My name's Terry Mason. My mother and father died in an accident when I was 12, and I was brought up by an only uncle. But my story really begins down in Santa Domingo, where I spent two years supervising one of the family plantations. Well, Santa Domingo was all right, but uh, believe you me, I was a very happy guy when the day finally arrived for me to board a ship to return to the States. The uh, main reason for that happiness was that, uh, well, because... Uh, <laughs> I was in love. Yeah. yeah. Not only in love, but on my way to get married. The girl was Barbara Norton. Boy, so you can just imagine how anxious I was for that boat to get to New York and get there fast. Well, I got to New York all right. And the following day in a little church downtown. Do you, Barbara Norton... Take this man to be your lawful wedded husband. I do. I do. Yeah, it was a beautiful ceremony, I guess. But I wasn't the man who married Barbara Norton. What happened? Oh, I don't know. There were probably a dozen reasons, so... Well, let's just say that two years was too long for her to wait. Now, a thing like that's pretty tough to take. 
All my hopes and dreams of a future were wrapped up in Barbara, and then all of a sudden, boom, there's nothing. Well, after she was gone, there was only one thing to do. To try to forget. To lose myself in bright lights, music, and the gay whirl of the city's night spots. When one place had closed, I'd dig up another. My uh, favorite hangout was the Sky Room. Oh, of course, I know I shouldn't have gone there, because everybody knew me, but... Uh, I just liked the idea of kicking it around 40 stories above the ground. I never took a table. Just sat at the bar and listened hazily to the music and the jungle conversation. You care to dance, Margot? Oh, not yet, thanks, Lamont. I'm having too much fun just watching. Look at that couple over there. Yes, <laughs> I was noticing them. What is that they're doing? Dancing. Dancing? Mm -hmm. well, it looks like a Hopi Indian ritual. <laughs> Well, I think that they think that they're doing the conga. Oh, I see. And if I'm right, then Madame Lazonga cheated them out of the last five lessons. <laughs> Is it customary to conga to waltz music? Well, I don't think it would make any difference to them. Say, hey, Lamont, do you see that young man sitting at the bar? Yeah. He's been staring at you for the past ten minutes. Wait. I believe I know him. Why, of course. That's young Terry Mason. I haven't seen him in years. Well, if he's a friend, ask him over. Do you mind? No, not at all. Oh, Terry. Terry. Yeah? Oh, Lamont. Come on over. If he can make it. Oh, I almost landed on that table. <laughs> Hello, Terry. Glad to see you. How are you, Lamont? Fine, fine. Now, this is Miss Lane, Terry. Oh, how do you do, Miss How do you do? Lane? Sit down, won't you? Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, tell me. Where have you been all these years? Huh? Oh, Santa Domingo. Plantation stuff two years ago. Oh, finally get fed up and come back? Are you kidding? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> you know I came back. Well, no, really, I don't, Terry. Oh, you see, Miss Lane, that's Cranston for you. He's always the gentleman. Well, I'll tell you, my friend, I came back to get married. Yeah, that, that man's fulfillment, marital bliss. <laughs> Did you know what happened? <laughs> well, it's, it's very melodramatic. I was jilted. Oh, it's a shame. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was I waiting at the church. <laughs> oh, come on. Let's have a drink. Who was the girl? Barbara Norton. Oh, yes. I know her. Oh, sure, sure. Nice kid. Yeah, good to her parents. Woman of her word, too. Yeah. Yeah, woman of her word. Sorry, Terry. Sure, that's what they all say. Sorry, Terry. I worked, Lamont. I worked like a dog for two years in the filthy tropics to prove myself to her, and because of that work, I lost her. And just what happened, Terry? I was away too long. Well, that's the story they give me anyway, away too long. But that isn't the real story, not by a long shot. What do you mean? They're all working together on this thing. They're working against me. Who? Who's working together? My uncle and Barbara and her father, Dr. Norton. I don't understand, Terry. Well, my uncle controls my inheritance. Today I learned that he and Dr. Norton were planning to confine me in the doctor's private sanitarium. What do you think of that? Well, perhaps they're doing it for your own good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like Barbara married somebody else for my own good? Oh, no. Now they're all working together. They want that inheritance. And if they get me to that sanitarium, they know they'll have it. Where is this place? It's up the Hudson. It used to be our family home. Terry... I think you're putting too much stress on this whole thing. Lamont, you've got to believe me. If they can find me in that place, I'll never come out alive. Well, in spite of all I could do, they put me in that sanitarium the next day. It's for your own good, Terry, they kept telling me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what they really meant was that it was for their own good. Well, I kept my eyes and ears open, waiting waiting for something to happen. And then that, that very first night in the hall of the sanitarium, a sound was heard. Faintly at first. Ever so faintly. Then footsteps. Nearer. 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 I rushed to the phone quickly. I knew that I had to call Lamont Cranston at once. He was the only one that I could turn to. The only one. Oh, don't answer it, Lamont. I know it'll be someone who'll give you an excuse for not taking me to the lecture. That, Margot, would be the trick of the week. <laughs> no such luck. I'd better answer. Hello. 
Yes? Oh, yes, Terry. Where are you? The sanitarium. What? Murder? Well, are you sure? I see. Yes, I know where the place is. All right. I'll be right up. What's the trouble? That was Terry Mason. Someone's been murdered at the sanitarium. Come along, Margot. We must go there at once. Mr. Cranston, when you was first telling me that I'm taking you in my cab up to this house on the Hudson, I think I've only one house which is up on the Hudson, and this house is not a house of which I am very fond of, on account of the bars which are on the window. Yes, I know, Shrevey. Uh, turn left into this driveway. Yes. Is that the sanitarium up there on the hill, Lamont? Yes, Margaret. It's a grim-looking place, isn't it? Old stone walls and high turrets. It almost looks like, like a prison. Yeah, the house of which I am referring to is a prison also, although it ain't the same house. You'd uh, better stop here, Shrevey. Yes, sir. Aren't you going right up the door? No. Terry will meet us at the cellar door. He doesn't want anyone to know we're coming. Lamont, do you really think that a murder's been committed here? I don't know, Margot. This whole thing may be a wild goose chase. Young Terry's in a highly nervous condition. But I do think it's worth an investigation. Do you wait here, Shrevey? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm keeping beside me my jack handle, just in case. <laughs> Come on, Margot. Look, the whole place is shrouded in darkness. Well, it's quite late, you know. Yes, but you'd think that they'd... Come on. Yes? What's that? What? What are you talking about? Look. That cloaked figure disappearing in the shadows of the building. Yes. Yes, I see him. Margot. That... That looks very much like Terry's uncle. Oh, you know him? Yes. Both he and Dr. Norton are old friends of mine. Oh, God. Well... I wonder what he's doing here. Oh, uh, this must be the cellar door that Terry mentioned. He should be right inside. Is that you, Lamont? Yes. I have Miss Lane with me. Come in, both of you. Watch your step. Now, follow me. Terry, what is all this... Shh. Huh? You must be quiet, please. Oh, sorry. The murderer is still in the house. Perhaps even at this very moment, he's listening to our conversation. What murderer? Who are you talking about? I'll just stop here. Now. Now, do you see that door? Yes. That leads to the operating door. In that room is the body of the woman who's been murdered. How do you know? They took her there a few minutes ago. Who? Who are they? My uncle and Dr. Norton. That was Terry's uncle that we saw. Yes. Look, Terry. How do you know that a murder has been committed? Well, I, I, I just know, that's all. Did you actually see it done? No, no, I didn't. Well, but I did hear something. Weird music in a minor key, accompanied by the uneven thump of a cripple walking. When the music reached a crescendo, the woman screamed, and then she was found dead. Who is the woman? An elderly patient here at the sanitarium. But you have no actual proof, Terry. Lamont, you've got to believe what I'm telling you. It was murder. Well, who would kill her? What was the motive? I have a theory about that, too. In fact, it's more than a theory. That old lady who just died was a very wealthy woman. My uncle handles all of her investments. In fact, everyone in the sanitarium is a person of wealth, and all of them are friends of my uncle and Dr. Norton. You're not accusing them of murder, Terry. Why not? Why, they got me here. To get me out of the way. That's why I'm just one of the hand-picked victims. But they're not getting me, do you hear? That's why I called you to help me. Oh, now, Terry. Terry, take it easy. Margo, take Terry upstairs to his room. See that he takes something to make him sleep. No. No, I want to know. I want to know what that music was that I heard. That music of death. Please, Terry. If you want me to help you, you must go along with Margo. I want to investigate a few things here by myself. All right. All right, this way, Miss Lane, up these stairs. Lamont, what are you going to do? I'm going to pay a visit to that operating room, Margot, as the shadow. Have you examined the body completely, Doctor? Yes. And believe me, when the coroner arrives, he'll find nothing wrong. You're sure of that? Yes, yes, I am. Now, Doctor, what can we do about Terry? Frankly, I don't know. The boy must be taken care of. He must be. <laughs> what? what was that? You'll pardon my intruding on your private conversation, gentlemen. Well, who are you? Where are you? I am called the Shadow, gentlemen. 
A shadow. You've heard of me, perhaps? Oh, yes, of course. Then you must know that although I stand here beside you, you cannot see me. By my hypnotic power, I've clouded your mind. Oh, well, why are you here? I'm seeking information, gentlemen. Information about the death of that woman whose body lies on the table before you. Why, why, there is no information to give you. No? How did she die? We can't tell that until the coroner arrives. It couldn't have been murder, Doctor? Murder? I don't know what you mean. Just before her death, did you by any chance hear music? Weird music? Or the thud of a crippled foot? No, no. No, no, we heard nothing. Why are you so anxious to get rid of young Terry Mason? Get... get rid of him? Yes. Didn't I hear you say that the boy must be taken care of? Well, I... I didn't mean it that way. Those were your words, gentlemen. Look here, Shadow, what is this all about? You both know too well what this is all about. But just let me warn you. I am very interested in the welfare of young Terry Mason. And because of that, I shall keep a close watch on both of you. And if anything should happen to him, anything at all, gentlemen, I warn you, your answer to the shadow. Hop in, Margot. All right, thanks. Mr. Cranston, I ask that you should ignore paying any attention to that taxi meter. The jack handle I'm holding for my protection slipped and fell against it, and it ups 20 bucks. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll ignore it, all right. I am referring to it on my account slip as paper profits. <laughs> okay, sweetie. Isn't he wonderful? <laughs> Lamont, what did you learn down here? Well, I went into that operating room as the shadow. Terry's uncle and Dr. Norton were examining the corpse of the old woman who died. Do you think that she was murdered? Well, I saw no evidence of violence. Both men swore that she'd met a natural death. Well, then you think it was just Terry's imagination after all? No, no, I don't. It's hard to say at this point just what I think. You still think that Terry might be right? Yes. Yes, I do. What do you propose to do? I think I'm going to call on you for help, Margot. Me? Help? How? Tomorrow, I want you to go to Dr. Norton's office. Pretend that you're verging on a nervous breakdown and gain admittance to the sanitarium as a patient. How does one acquire a nervous breakdown? Well, uh, just watch Shreve. He take these turns. <laughs> Not a bad suggestion. But seriously, Margot, I do this myself. Only Dr. Norton and Terry's uncle both know me. What do you say? Well, sure, sure, I'll do it. Good girl. You must see the doctor first thing tomorrow. Gain admittance to the sanitarium no later than tomorrow night. Quite comfortable, Miss Lang? Yes. Yes, thank you, nurse. Well, there's a cord above your bed if you wish to ring for me. Yes, I know you told me that. I'll just uh, open your window and put out your light. There. Now, to try and get a good night, please. I'll try. Good night. Good night. Good night. Try to get a good night's sleep. That's funny. Well, I can try anyway, I guess. What's that? Where's that light? There. Oh, it doesn't work. The lights have been cut off. Somebody's coming in the door. Who's there? Why don't you answer me? Don't come any closer. Don't come any closer. Quiet, Miss. It's not Terry Mason. Oh, oh, you frightened me. Sorry, but you must come with me to the cellar at once. The killer is loose again. You all right? Oh, Lamont, what are you doing here? I was outside keeping watch when I heard the scream. I... First, I thought it might have been you. No, I'm all right, thanks to Terry here. I think the murderer is struck again. Yes, and just the way that Terry described. The weird music, footsteps, and then, then the scream. Who was it this time? I don't know. But there was one unusual thing that Miss Lane didn't mention. The footsteps seemed to be coming down a staircase, and yet there are no stairs in that wing of the house. Yes, I noticed that, too. Anything else? Yes, yes, there is. About 25 minutes ago, I heard the house phone ring. I listened in on the extension in my room, and I heard my uncle tell Dr. Norton that he'd be over here shortly. Yes, I saw his car drive in. Well, there's no doubt that there's someone next door in the operating room. Yeah, it sounds like uncle and Dr. Norton. 
Perhaps they have the latest victim's body in there. Oh, Lamont. You and Terry go back upstairs at once. Let's get back to your rooms before you're missed. Yes, sir. That's right. Come on this way. I'll be right with you, Terry. Lamont, what are you going to do now? The shadow is going to pay another call in the operating room and try to unravel this mystery. Now, see here. I think this thing has gone too far. But, Doctor, you promised me that we'd see this through together. I know, I know. But this second death is too much. <laughs> huh? I should say that's an understatement, Dr. Norton. The shadow again. Yes, gentlemen. This time I shan't be as lenient with you. The body on the table shall be examined by me, not you, Doctor. Why? You fool the police with your first murder. You'll do the same with the second one. Are you... Are you accusing us of killing? I am. Oh, no. What's this? So, step over here, gentlemen. That's it. Now, examine that mark behind the patient's left ear. Look, Doctor. He's right. The shadow's right. That tricornered puncture was the cause of this woman's death. And it was murder. So, you agree with me at last. But, but you don't think that we, that we killed him? I'm not sure yet. I want you both to go to Dr. Norton's study. And don't leave there until the shadow calls. Hello? Are you alone, Margo? Yes, yes, Lamar. I'm coming right up to your room. The murderer is about to strike again. Oh, no. Yes, Margo. And I have reason to believe that you have been selected as his next victim. Who is it? Lamont. Open up, Margo. Oh, Lamont, I'm so glad you're here. Put out your light, Margo. Quickly. Yes, surely. We must have darkness. Why? You'll see. I purposely called on you on the house phone. Because I knew that the murderer would be listening in. Then, through his fear of my knowing his identity, he'll pick this time to try to kill us both. Oh, that's a pleasant little thought. Who is this murderer? If I'm not mistaken, it'll be a long, black, highly poisonous snake that leaves a tri-cornered mark on its victim. A snake? Oh, gosh, Lamont, they scare me to death. Quiet, please, Margot. The snake may be in the room now, ready to strike. We've got to listen for it. Oh, well, it's probably my imagination, but I can make myself believe it's crawling around my leg now. Shh, listen. Look out, Margo! Oh! I, I got him. Oh, Lamont. I saw him come in through that window. I guess I closed it on him just in time. Oh, you cut his body in two. Yes. Well, that takes care of that. So that's our murderer. No, Margo. Only the instrument of death. Our murderer should be paying us a call in a moment to add the final macabre touch to what he expects has been a double killing this time. Listen. You hear that? Yes, that same sound. We'll stand over here by the wall. It sounds again as if he were descending a flight of stairs. Yet there are no stairs. I know. Don't speak. Just watch that panel on the wall. See? It's slowly opening. Stay there, Margot. Oh, I've got you now. Oh, you've got him, Lamont. You've got him. Yes, he'll play a different tune this time. Put on the light, Margot. All right. There. There's our murderer. Oh, he's unconscious. Yes. That face, Lamont. Those long fangs and popping eyes. He doesn't look human. It isn't human, Margot. That's a mask that was worn to hide his true identity. See? I'll take it off. There. Why, Lamont. It's... Well, that just about ends my story, folks. But gosh, you can see what a mess I almost got Lamont and his lane in. Fortunately for them, they found out the murder in time. This killer's motive was a familiar one. Revenge. Trying to implicate those who he thought had wronged him. As you uh, probably have already deduced, the club foot was a disguise. And the weird music came from a strange oboe-like instrument that he used to hypnotize the snake. Now, yes, he thought he was being very smart. But, well, right on down the line, it's been pretty well proven that the smart guy in the long run gets just what he gives out. Time to go, so Terry. So, when I... Terry Mason. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize that so long. 
I was just uh, telling these people a story. And not a bad one either, if I do say so myself. You'd better come along, Mason. Okay, okay. Good night, folks. Goodbye. Oh, Heavenly Father, have most infinite mercy upon this lost soul and receive him unto thee, Domini Ora Pro Nobis Copa. Having been sentenced to die for committing the crime of murder, I hereby pronounce Terry Mason legally dead. Friends, you won't want to miss next Sunday's exciting story of the shadow, when Lamont and Margot find themselves in an abandoned old western mining town. Look here, guard. Just why is it that you're so afraid to have Lamont and me ride through that old town down there? Uh, lady, when I told you Bad Creek was a ghost town, I didn't just mean it was a deserted village. It's really a town of ghosts. Today's program is based on a story copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters, names, places, and plot are fictitious. And a similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Thank you.